So moving forwards, we have a York 863, which the customer says has got some one or two issues with it being fiddled with. Now, it's come with the side screws, which have once belonged to not a radio, but usually a SW711 extension speaker. So we'll take those out because I have a tendency not to send things like that back because we don't expect accessories with the sets. So this had the holes filled in and it's been repainted and it's certainly smartened up. I think he says that somebody has removed the shrouds, there should be some felt circles round each switch so you can't see the works of the radio, the chassis of the radio, through those. And I understand they're all missing, and I also understand that somebody has installed an LED lighting strip so that the innards lights up or something. So if that's what the case is, that's all coming out. In fact, I may as well switch a soldering iron on ready, and we may as well take all the screws out because we're going to have to get to both sides of the radio because it isn't going to be straightforward. I'm just hoping there's nothing dodgy going on which also has to be removed because we can't always recover sets that have had dodgy goings on. The uh, bezel's been painted silver. Possibly the knobs as well. Okay, so carefully take that off. Well, to be honest, that looks immaculate inside. <laughs> Here we go. I'll tell you what, I think we'd better test this as it's been presented because once you start delving into um, unmessing about somebody's radio, the last thing you want to do is to generate a fault and you didn't know whether the fault was there before. So I think we need to just read the specs off this radio before we start doing anything to it. For some reason the seal number plate's missing off the back. And that's usually you notice it was nicked at one point. But you know, at what point? One of the things I used to enjoy when I worked as an engineer at Nottingham Radio is people would come in with business two way radios which had got the serial number missing and I would read the serial number back off the inside of the radio or from its internal memory and put a new serial number sticker on the back of the radio having run it through our computer first and sometimes radios belong to somebody else and when I was at Compass at Bradford somebody came in with a radio which they'd bought and it belonged to Meals on Wheels Leeds so I told Meals on Wheels at Leeds and said to the customer that he needed to give it them back. So, a 
connect this up to power. We're on 13.8 volts. So, let's see. Volume, squelch, RF gain up. Dimmer works the opposite way to what you expect. Mic gain. Tone we want to high. Normal. Normal. Delta tune is broken. Uh, Mr. Chippy might be able to fix that if there's still some works in the switch, but there's nothing we can do about replacements. So, let's see where we are with it. I'll switch picture and picture on. And we'll get... We'll add to his Bible reading second-hand piece of paper, which... I wonder. I, I, I just wonder what the next piece of second-hand paper is. The next second-hand piece of paper is our RS invoice. So the next customer will get that. I'm from Yorkshire originally. You know, I don't waste paper. No. We don't need... Oh, we'll use that just to rest on. We'll be using the Rotel 240 manual for this. York 863. So let's have a look at what transmit's doing. Turn the volume down as well. It's doing on 3 watts. It's doing 3.6 watts. So hoping we can bring that up a bit for him. Usually can. Um, let's look at deviation. Wallow, it's 3.5. Which is no good at all. Frequency. Let's hope it isn't like yesterday's Mustang and I tried to adjust it and it all fell apart. It's a bit low, but it's within spec. I'll do that right now and then it's out of the way. To be, to be honest, it doesn't look messed about with electronically. It just looks messed about with physically. Set that slightly high, then it's got room to drop. And there's the door. Oh, that was the post, so... Uh, don't normally have anything to sign for, but for some reason she'd got a DHL package which needed signing for. Well, they're not signing, but they want to make sure that I'm around and when they dump it on the doorstep. I wish people wouldn't do stuff with signature because it still gets dumped on the doorstep. Um, Right, where are we? Let's look at receive. Done that. The next job we've got lined up is that radiogram that came in. So any of you who don't want to see that, the next three videos don't bother looking at because we're going to be doing a 1973 HMV 2411 stereo master radiogram when I had a television and audio shop in Yorkshire in the late 70s and early 80s I was an HMV dealer and I did all the training courses and this has come in and it doesn't work on one channel not helped by the fact that somebody's pinched both the speakers from that channel. Bizarre. So let's look at what receives doing. So I'll put the sign meter on. See what we're getting. Switch your camera over. Um not too bad so we're looking at and I'll now show you the attenuator controls so 
So we've got the big hand on one. <laughs> we've got the small hand on four. And so we're doing 400 microvolts. No, sorry, we're doing 0 0.4 microvolts for 12 dB cyanide. I think we should go and mess about with this. I think we're we're having an organ interlude at the end of this uh, thing. Somebody said I've got to go in the organ workshop and make these um, fabric circles, which are going to be missing. And I'll just turn this off. And um, somebody said, would I play Vidor's Toccata on the pipe organ? which is finished in our workshop and I said well no because I've never bothered learning the horrendously difficult to play piece yeah it could happen but the reason is there's no nowhere I play out of my six churches that has an organ with enough notes so what you know if I was if I did play it and could play it I'd just be hitting the end stop or not having enough pedals or whatever so it would be pointless learning it and the other thing is all the organs I play are direct mechanical action which is known as tracker action and that's great, it's fantastic because they're very very reliable you know you're looking at hundreds and hundreds of years of life expectancy but all these cathedral organs have power assisted action or direct electric action so you press a note and it makes an electrical contact and inside the organ itself there's a solenoid which admits the air into the organ pipes and so it's no harder to play than an electronic organ so yeah it's a very difficult piece to play but with electric action you're you're not kind of pressing the weight of the of the actual machinery, and uh, so that's the that's the point. Now that piece was written, I think it was about I think it was after 1914, but the standards on pipe organs changed in 1914, and we, they agreed on some kind of in industry standard, so that consoles all had five octave keyboards, 61 notes, all had 30 pedals in the UK or 32 in America uh, and so on but you see all the organs I play the earliest sorry the newest one I play is 1904 so they're all you know 1860s 70s 1890s 1904 and so the consoles are totally non-standard and you know things like that you're just not going to be playing now my sister is what you'd call a recital organist, whereas I'm a church organist. So she plays clever pieces and things very well. And she came over and she... I said, I want you to bring Vidor's Toccata with you, and I want you to see if you can play it on this organ in our workshop. And... She got to the end of the first page and she couldn't continue because it was far too tiring to do so. So, you know, that, that was exactly what I was expecting. So we've had the... Yeah, so they've removed the receive lamp. We can do that. We've got lamps in stock. Uh, oh, I think they're just white lamps, aren't they? Behind, Yeah, they're white lamps behind a coloured... Um, uh, bezel so that's fine so we'll just put a, a normal white meter lamp in that position and then Bob's your uncle hopefully that one I didn't look whether that worked and I think we'll just we'll do that because I don't want to have all this front off and then we've wasted our time let's just see where did I put the mic Unbelievable, isn't it? I put it up there, right next to the mics. 
We have four mics on this bench. So let's see what happens. Make sure we're in transmit on the thing. Yeah, so that's that's worth your treat. Oh, look at that meter banging across. Boy, oy, 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 oy. Yeah, for a radio that does 3.6 watts, that's great. I'd best take that out, and this radio's probably going to be a two-day job. We, I mean, obviously, as organ builders, we're doing this as a as a secondary thing just to help people out. Um, I can't devote whole days to sorting out CB radios, but I can pass this on to Mr. Chippy because he may be able to dismantle this switch and piece the innards back together if the innards aren't missing. So that's going to have to be desoldered. That's been put in so you couldn't see through that blank hole. Alright, I'll see what's inside this. I'll see what's inside the switch. So I've dismantled the switch and although it doesn't have much feel to it, it is now working. So we've got those two contacts at the initial position and then if we move it to the central position it's those two contacts and then we move it to the third position and it's those two contacts so that is now working now I've got the fun of putting all the wires back on it <laughs> Right, so what we've done, I've turned that switch apart, it's been cleaned, so it feels a bit nasty, but all the wiring's put back on, you've got um, one, two, three with connections there, and one at the back. These have all been cleaned out, all the lugs, and they've all been put through and J-hooked around, and then soldered, so it's not just shoved on, so hopefully that will all work beautifully. What is it anyway? Oh, it's Delta Tune. That's pretty useless. Whilst I've got the camera in this position, you will notice if I find a if I can find a green trimming tool that the PA. Oh, I don't know where those are. You've got these three adjustments in the PA. And these are very important to not only tune the PA, but to balance it. And straight away, because you must never use a metallic tool, like this is a metallic tool. And I hope you can see on the camera, there's actually a chunk out of that, uh, that white one down there. So... I'm just hoping there's going to be it's not actually snapped all the way down so you know it's had the screwdriver expert tweaking it up but they've actually managed to tweak it down to 3.6 watts <laughs> it does amaze me right I'm going to go over to the organ workshop and we'll make these uh, these little circular shrouds and I'll take a camcorder with me now the format of this test bench and the format of the camcorder differ and it takes a long time for the computer when we edit these to kind of put the two together. I'm talking about an hour and a quarter. So it's worth doing because it's, it's still be good for you to see. So we'll put that back to the normal position and I'm going over to the organ workshop. So like we did once before, we're going to, whoops, we're knocking the camcorder as usual. Uh, we're in the organ workshop. And what we're going to do is to drop things on the floor.
So we're going to use wad punches to do some fabric washers. This is a my scrap Binatone, let's see whether that's in camera, um, Binatone 5 Star which once went to Radio Cruncher for a little visit and uh, so what we're doing is we're going to make some of these fabric washers and when you put the front on these sets if they're missing you see the works of the radio and so the current job in hand is that these are missing and on all the scrap chassis I've got they're all missing I just made that one earlier just to prove I've got the right punches here so we want to make another one two three another five so I've got a piece of oak in the vise uh, it's just a matter of punching out with a readily available one punch six of these or five because I made one If I'd, I wish I'd got one on a scrap radio, and at least I could see what the size is supposed to be. This is the size I've come up with to not interfere with each other, but conversely to shroud the innards. And I won't be charging the customer for these because we're, uh, we're having a bit of an experiment, aren't we, as well. Okay, so that's the material that HBox 21 kindly sent me. So what we need to now do is centralise the smaller punch. And then hopefully it'll be more or less in the centre. You can buy some hole punch kits which have the inner and outer hole um, you can put different dies in but as you can well imagine, I want poking out in the other workshop uh, but as you can imagine they're horrendously expensive so we don't really want to spend hundreds of pounds on things which don't have to be Trying to get them as central as I can. Right, so just to put them on my radio here that's the idea and so now when you move the switches around you don't see you won't see through the front panel the bit left behind whereas on that switch we've not touched you can see the works of the switch. So that's what it's about. And that's what we're doing for this gentleman. So I'll just plonk them on there. And that one didn't punch through properly. So 
but we've been able to push it out i put it on the third knob along so there we are that's those done so i'll pop those on the radio we'll go back to the other workshop but while i'm in here i'll do this piece at the end where well, i'm going to play the pipe organ in here and uh as somebody said you know about playing some posh pieces and i'm saying well it's in the continental organ it's not a recital organ it's meant to be playing hymns on and psalms in a church it's not really for playing anything beyond say the wedding march but um, i've got a, a showy kind of piece which was written by Carlib Simper, um, in, who was a British composer in 1890s. And um, he did some quite effective pieces for pipe organ and for harmonium, for those people with foot prompt reed organs, as they were called. Uh, and I'll play one of those pieces on the pipe organ. But we'll go back to the other workshop and carry on with the radio. Right, having made the fibre washers in the organ workshop, which are now on the radio. I suppose we ought to check the VCO because you just don't know. Although it looks immaculate, you just don't know. So on this radio, we turn our attentions to channel 40. So that's channel 40 selected. I expect it's a floating chassis. So I'd better put that on power supply negative. There we go. And then we've got to go to the test point one, which is there. And what should it be? What does the service manual say? Go to channel 40 and check that it's 4 volts. And that's T1 on receive. That'll do me. Going to transmit. And check that it's four volts on transmit. Three point six five. We'll adjust the trimmer capacitor. Go back to receive, they are interactive and it's still for something. And go to transmit, it's still for something. So that will do. So go to channel 1 and they expect it to be between 1.8 and 2.5, which it is. And on transmit, the same, which it is. So it didn't need adjusting, but I've done it anyway. So to go through the transmit, we're going to do that, that, and that coil. Select channel 20. Many a time I've tuned it up on the channel we've just used to do the VCO and had to do it again. That's part of having a memory like a sieve. So we're doing 3.6 watts. Yeah, picture and pictures on. Not easy to get into that. Nevertheless, we're there. So next we're going to go across to these three. And I have to look at the instructions every single time with this. So it's 4, 8 and 9. L4, L8, L9. First of all, we adjust them for maximum. To do that, we need the green plastic trimming tool 
got the trimming tools on the floor where you'd expect it to be. So going to transmit. Maximum. The one I was worried about has moved, so maximum. And the one which I didn't worry about, we can't move. I think it's got some wear on the inside where someone has used the wrong tool. So we'll now have to use the wrong tool too to grip it. So there we are, we have five watts. So that's everything maximum. So now we rotate L4 to obtain 4.4 watts. We and we do that clockwise. So turn it clockwise for 4.4. So it's at five. And that comes down to 4.4, which is there. And then they want you to adjust L9 anti-clockwise until you get to 3.8 watts. Now, we're not going to set it for 3.8 watts. We're going to set it for 4 watts. So now we're at 4.4 anti-clockwise. There we go. So now we're going to check it on channel 40. I want it within half a watt of the different band ends. Channel 40. Four watts. Channel 1. Four watts. That is spot on. And when it's cold, it's about 4.05. So I'll put my white tool away. I'm glad I didn't have to try and find some cause. So that's brought it up nicely. I don't know where the other pen's gone, but we've got the Cats League pen. Never had a cat. That's the wrong one. That's the wrong prayer list. It's this one. No, that's the right one. I'll get it right eventually. So it's now four watts on that. So while we're playing about with power, we'll do the power meter. Which is that one, if I remember rightly. We already know it's banging across. We want that to read four. So it now reads four. We'll set low power, so I'll just need to find which switch it is. And looking at the front panel, it's the second one along. So now the radio should be doing 0 0.4 of a watt. Well, it's actually doing... Oh dear, it's doing 50 milliwatts. So with that preset there, That's now 400 milliwatts, which is where we want it. So we'll just go back to full power. There we go. So that's another thing done. Now deviation. We need the mic gain one to kind of central position, which is the vertical one. And then deviation is there. So we'll get the little oscillator out. It's probably about right. Wallow. Oh, I'm on the wrong reading, that's why. Wallow. It's still too high. Let's try it there. Wallow. One, two. Spot on. Guess that right. So it's 2.2 .2 to 2.5 absolute maximum. So as I keep saying, it's not like AM where louder is uh, makes you more heard. It has to be just right on FM so it's 2.2 .2 to 
to 2.5 kilohertz. So we've done that. This Cat's League's pen is not as good. Well, I reckon we've done everything on the transmitter. So now we'll look at the receiver. We'll start by going to the oscilloscope. I'll turn. We'll put S9 equivalent on the signal generator, which is 100 microvolts in the UK for a CV. Well, that looks nice. Let's see how nice it is. So with the detector coil, it was absolutely spot on as it was. Oh, actually, while we've got it, at, I've just set it. I've just put it down to 0.3 of a microvolt sensitivity, and we'll just go over to the cyanide meter. But while we've got it at this. Let's play with the delta tune switch. We're now in the center position. That's the up position. Center position, low position. Medium, low. Medium, high. So you can see it is spot on working. So we'll just go through this. Do the front end. Do you know, I wasn't expecting that. It was working so well that I didn't expect to have such a big difference. Do these IF ones with a bigger signal. Where's my metal tool gone? Oh well, we'll plod on with this one. That's actually brought the noise down. So really, that is the only one which seems to have ever been messed with. So let's look at what the sign lad's doing now. It's doing 0.24 microvolts. So we'll write that down. Now, 0.24 microvolts for 12 dB cyanide which is excellent and I'm going to show you that we've got 12 showing on the meter up there I'm going to put this over to the attenuator controls so you can see for yourselves so we've got the big hand at 0.3 and we've got the little one there's 3 0.25 2 is there and the hairline is on 0.24 turning out a nice radio because there's a big 
there's quite a wideness in performance of of all sets which use the same chassis. There really is basically only two versions of this, and what we'll say the York the York 861 Rotel 220 has got a little bit something less in the receiver, and from Rotel 230 Harvard 420M onwards, they're all the same. So theoretically, your Rotel 220 doesn't quite perform on receiver as well as your Rotel 230 and Rotel 240, but there's no difference between 220 and 230, uh, 230 and 240. Um, when you get to that model, there's no difference in innards. So um, let's do look at the squelch. So we will park this at 0.3 of the microvolts, set the squelch to full, put the signal generator on. It's coming in at 100 microvolts, and it's exactly where I want it to be. So it doesn't need any adjustment at all. Uh, and the preset for that is there. We're not touching it. So we're going to look now at the sensitivity of the squelch. So I switch the signal generator back to standby. We turn the squelch down to a hit threshold. Switch the signal generator on and see when it comes in. And the answer is it's coming in about 0.68 microvolts and it's going off at about 0.62 microvolts. So it's not as wide a hysteresis as some sets, but it should be absolutely fine. And then finally, we'll go and put S9 back on the signal generator, and I may as well just turn the picture and picture off, because it's pointless now, and we're going to set the S meter to S9. And it's showing S7 at the moment. So it was banging across on transmit, even though it was only doing 3.6 watts, and it was not as lively as it should be reading on there we go so that's now done and working well so all that remains for me to do is to connect a, a new lamp to the receive there which we'll do in fact I think it's afternoon cup of tea break time so I've hit upon a little snag in putting the receive lamp back and we will just glue gun that in because it's a little thinner than the originals. It's dimmer than I would like. Now they're not stupidly bright. And the receive one is not as bright as the transmit one. It's not supposed to be. It's going to transmit. Let's plug a mic in so we can go into transmit. So that is brighter. When you look at the circuit diagram, and I'm looking at the Rotel 240, I think we've gone in a bit farther. We've got two resistors when I my point is in the right place. We've got 150 ohms for transmit, we've got 270 ohms for receive. And these are 1 watt resistors. Now I haven't got the kind of value I'm going to guesstimate at. We don't want 150 ohms, but we want something a bit more than 270 ohms. Now the lamps I'm putting in draw 80 milliamps. Perhaps the ones that came out drew 50 milliamps. And so that different current is, is putting them in a, a different brightness. So what as it, we'll just do as an experiment, we'll parallel, I just want it a little bit brighter, it, not, not a huge difference. So if we put a 0.6 watt, 200 ohm resistor across it, will that be bright enough? So, whoops, we'll just uh, come back out again to the normal position. So we'll just touch this across where that resistor lives hopefully no I can't I can't tell what we're going to do we're going to get a decade resistance box out 
and we're going to go through until we find something we can think to be ideal. Right, so what we've done is to get out the decade resistance box. So by turning these knobs, we can simulate a resistor. So have we, we can see the receive light there. And I'm parallel across the existing resistor. So with Ohm's law, you can work out, because we know that the resistor in there is 270 ohms. So my idea was to put 200 in. I was trying it in the wrong place. So don't worry about that. That was actually the transmit light I was uh, putting across. So let's dial in 200 ohms. So what are we going to do? So that's too bright. Let's go up one. Let's go. Oh, that's two. That would be 200. Let's have that at nine. So I think. My idea of 200 could well be the right brightness. So if we put 100 in, that's too bright. That's 99. 199. Right, we'll turn it off and we'll put this resist fixed resistor across. I'll disconnect that. We'll switch the set back on. There it is, really dim. I'll just hold it across that, and that's the that is exactly the brightness we want. And this won't get stupidly hot because the existing resistor, which is one watt, is still actually doing most of the work. This is only doing a third of the work, and it's 0 0.6 watt rated. So ideally, I'd have liked to have changed the resistor for the correct one watt one of a different value. Uh, so we haven't got those. They're on order. And they will come Tuesday. But what I don't want to do is have this radio sat on the bench till Tuesday. So we'll do it this way. There'll be no charge to the customer for this. So we'll pop those off. And we'll do the bodge and put it on this side of the board. So it is obvious to somebody else, another repairer, that this is what has been changed to change the brightness. So we'll just tin the component. So it's 0 0.6 watt rated and it's 200 ohms. Now 200 ohms isn't a European preferred value. It's an American or a far, far Eastern preferred value. But it just happens to be the, luckily we've got one in stock. We have the European E24 values and we have the American resistor values also in stock uh, because we're dealing on Far Eastern and American equipment with what we do. So it was between, that's where I burn my fingers. So it's all right using maths and Ohm's law and all that to do the calculations. But we don't always, you can't tell from those calculations whether it's the brightness that you actually wanted. And that's exactly what I want. So we've got transmit, we've got receive, we've cracked it. And that won't melt the, because if you have this too bright, it's going to melt the front. So... We've chosen our brightness by using the decade resistance box, and I won't have shown you that before, but it's the kind of thing you have in a workshop. So now I feel confident to put the front back on. 
I think we'll do... Shall we use the hot glue gun or shall we use Bostic? I think on this instance we'll use the hot glue gun. So I'll take this to the other workshop where Mr. Chippy normally resides. I don't think he's there at the moment. Okay, so we're back with this. It's sticking out exactly the same as the other one, and we've just used the glue gun on that. So now it's time to put the front back on, which we'll do. However, you do get a bigger speaker on the Binotone 5 Star. So we've been doing uh, a few of these lately, and we've come to the conclusion that green is negative, haven't we? But we haven't done a Cybernet 134 because it was all those Cybernet 002s. So let's just check. Well, that's not showing. <laughs> okay, so yellow's negative on a Cybernet 134. How would you'd really expect that not? Of course, I managed to knock the pot of knobs and screws on the floor, didn't I? And because they've all been beautifully resprayed, I have got them to pick up. Well, so far, I have actually managed to find three of the six knobs. And five of the eight case screws. Now we have case screws in stocks, so that's not a problem. But the knobs are a problem because I've got to find them. Oh, while I, I'll just put this on one side. I'll tell you what, I picked up a tip, a really good tip from David who came over yesterday with that um, part. Here's a York A63 that Mr Chippy's piecing back together. It's um, had a lot of silly things done to it and Mr C's reversed a lot of it. And these controls are sealed on this type of radio and I'll just use that those pliers and the trouble is when you got them a bit dirty it's difficult to to get the cleaner in and David showed me that although they're sealed which they are if you take them out you've got holes and you can get it to line up you get your service hole and you can get that through the hole. So I've done this all those years and I never realised they did actually have a hole but you've got to go to the trouble of taking it off the front panel to get to it so it's uh, it's quite a job. I mean this one's one I prepared earlier, you could say. For those of you who don't know where that phrase came from, there was a children's magazine television programme called Blue Peter. I don't know whether it's still going. I've not had a television for 20-odd uh, for years. But um, they would all, they'd be making some model out of egg boxes and yoghurt pots. And there'd be one... Here's one I pre I made earlier. I'm sure the cameraman made the one earlier. You know, it wasn't uh, was never was them surely. So that's where it comes from. Here I uh, here's one I prepared earlier. So that's a really good tip from David, for which I thank him. Uh, right, I'll go and find the screws, and then we'll just finish off with putting it on the aerial. Right, so this is the point 
where we find if the internal speaker works. There we are, lit up with RX. One and a Roger. Nineteen a Roger. Well, there we are. So it's finished. Oh, there's still a screw missing. Yeah, I'd, I've managed to find the knobs off the floor, but I didn't find one of the screws. Now, that isn't a problem because we have brand new screws in stock. I'll just put these side thumb screws back because I'm going to have a tendency to send the radio back with one missing. So yeah, I know about the screw, that's got to go in. And we'll prop that up ready for an on-the-air test. So he's, uh, I presume the, the customer has painted this himself and done the front panel and he's removed the escutcheon and uh, painted the, the bezel so nicely, the knobs nicely. And that was one of the problems with losing the knobs. I could, I could find another couple of York knobs, but they wouldn't match the paint that he's used. So we'd have to clear the floor somewhat makes a change so oh is that the, is that the missing screw no I'm not looking it is you know yep that's the right one as soon as you stop looking they uh, turn up don't they it doesn't matter what you're looking for I could see money going around in my washing machine today I put 40 quid in my pocket uh, yesterday. Never seen so much money, you know. Especially for me as a Yorkshireman. And um, let's put this camera back to its normal position. There we go. And um, I'm just watching two tenors and a 20 going around my washing machine. It's lucky they have turned UK currency to plastic. Or that might have uh, uh, not come out so well. Uh, so that puts a new light on money laundering. So thank you for watching. Quite a involved job but we're not charging the customer for those um, fiber washers because it's part of a demonstration we won't be charging the customer for the rx light series resistor because it was part of a demonstration so he's not going to have as much to pay as he probably fears and now we're going to put on the end the as requested by one or two viewers me playing the Tango Towers 1877 Conica pipe organ in our church organ restoration workshop. So somebody wanted some a piece which was a bit more showy, and uh, we are limited because it's a it's a uh, a complimental organ. You know, it's there to play hymns and psalms in a church environment, so it's not full of uh, mixtures and reeds and things. And um, so I hope it works out all right. Hope I hit some of the right notes as well. So although the this organ, which is 1877, built in Huddersfield by Peter Conacher and Company in 1877, did I say that? Although it's a traditional mechanical action pipe organ, uh, it does have an electric blower. And although that blower only draws 550 watts, so two amps, when I have electrical things put in for pipe organs here in the workshop we have two positions for organs we're working on I've shown you before the other nearly finished one I can't resist having big switches we don't need that at all and then to the left we have it on a contactor so I'm going to switch it on from the console from the remote control at the console. So we now have the blower running and we might just be able to see through a gap the bellows having risen.
So that's a double rise blower, so if I switch off the blower, you'll see the bellows will fall. And if we switch back on the blower, and that is what, on that bellows are weights to give the organ the pressure it works at, which is about three and a half water gauge. So we work on water gauge on organs, three and a half inches of water gauge. So that's how far it would push three and a half inches of water through a Bordon tube. So I've shown before, I'll do it again. The organ pipes in that box with the shutters allows us to have volume over them by opening and closing the shutters. And the organ pipes that live on the bottom keyboard, it's known as the great organ, whereas the upper keyboard is the swell organ, are open to atmosphere and so they're always the same volume. The stops which put on the different ranks of pipes are controlled from these levers which go to the stop knobs and of course when we pull or push one of these whichever way around it is that's what there's a slide up there and that makes the holes in the soundboard which is the pipes live on correspond and puts the pipes into play hence they're called stops because they stop off the air so we'll just go and play it <laughs> Cantata, The Rolling Seasons by Carlos Simple. Staying with this book, just see if there's anything else in here which might be a bit more totally different in contrast. So that was about as exciting a piece as you're ever going to play on an organ that's this type of instrument, uh, uh, one that's made for the accompaniment of hymns. Um, let's have a look at that. We'll just change the different stops, in other words, the ranks of pipes which we're going to be playing on. This is a much quieter piece of music, and it's the meditation from the same book, which was the, the copyright 1926 on this, still in print. <laughs>
see whether we can play this pastoral um, without any practice. You'll notice there is wind noise on organs in our workshop which aren't finished. A lot of the time only every other screw is installed, as you can well imagine. <laughs>
1877 comment on Ford, 